Hello, I am Judge Travis Francis, and welcome to This Moment in Democracy. This is a special edition episode recorded on November 2nd, 2022. This episode is being conducted with the Election Nerds, created by the Center for Election Reform, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to the study of election reform issues. Today's episode is brought to you by the Center for Election Reform and the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Our guest today is Ambassador Norman Eisen. Ambassador Eisen is currently a senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings and is an internationally recognized authority on law, ethics, and anti-corruption. He most recently served as special counsel to the House Judiciary Committee from 2019 to 2020, including for the impeachment and trial of former President Donald Trump. While at Brookings, Ambassador Eisen has authored reports on the Emoluments Clause, Presidential Obstruction of Justice, and the Democracy Playbook. He served as the U.S. Ambassador to the Czech Republic from 2011 to 2014, where he helped develop strategies in anti-corruption. From January 2009 to January 2011, Ambassador Eisen worked in the White House as special counsel and special assistant to the president for ethics and government reform. The press dubbed him, quote, Mr. No, unquote, and, quote, the ethics czar for his tough anti-corruption approach. He also advised President Obama on lobbying regulation, campaign finance law, and open government issues to assure the most scandal-free White House in modern history. Prior to his government service, Ambassador Eisen was a partner in a DC law firm where he specialized in litigation and investigations. His cases included Enron, the subprime financial collapse, the Monica Lewinsky matter, and the 2000 and 2004 presidential recounts and has been named one of DC's top lawyers. Ambassador Eisen received his Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School in 1991 and his Bachelor of Arts from Brown University in 1985. Ambassador Eisen, thank you for joining us. Judge, thanks for having me. It's a privilege to be here. Ambassador, I'd like to start, and I'm referring to a democracy crisis in the making. Um, you focus on state legislators and legislatures and what's going on in those bodies across the country. Can you tell our listeners what precisely are the state legislatures doing to attack our democracy? And how are they usurping control over voting procedures? Uh, the, uh, in our uh, States United report, uh, democracy um, crisis uh, in the making. Um, we lay out the ways um, that across the country, uh, these um, state legislatures are attempting to um, uh, really to substitute their judgment for that uh, of the uh, American people, for that of the voters. Uh, as uh, the election nerds know well, the foundation uh, of American democracy, uh, the thing that um, gives legitimacy to the functioning of our constitutional republic uh, it, uh, are free fair and secure elections, uh, accurate ones. And all of those adjective character, adge adjectives characterize the 2020 election. But um, because that's why the election nerds, that's why you're the election nerds as opposed to any other kind of nerds, Judge, 
because that's the critical piece of our democracy. And it worked in 2020. But the losers in 2020 uh, have a different vision. Instead of um, the voters choosing their leaders, we have a democracy crisis in the making now in the United States, to use the title of our States United report, because these election denying leaders want to choose their voters. They want to say um, that even if they don't get the most votes, that they or their allies won. And so what you find is that this sentiment has driven uh, over 200 and 40 bills in 33 states that would politicize, criminalize, or otherwise interfere with election administration needlessly and wrongly. And 24 of those bills have become law or been adopted in this election year of 2022 alone. So um, that uh, creates a crisis for our country. Fortunately, some of the worst bills have not become law, but, you know, we are in this battle for the soul of our democracy. You know, I'm going to get back to that question momentarily because I, there are a couple other subparts to it that I have. But you mentioned electors um, picking their voters as opposed to the voters selecting um, who, the, who, the, who, the, who the politicians are, who their representatives are. Now, isn't that somewhat uh, analogous to what gerrymandering and, and redistricting is all about as well? Aren't there, particularly gerrymandering, is, isn't that sort of the, the, um, the elected official attempting to select their, their voters? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a classic. It, it, it is a, a classic example. Um of um, uh, uh, ways to dilute, distort, and deny uh, the will of the voters of partisan politicians. And at the States United uh, Democracy Center, and States United Action, our C3 and our C4 organizations, right. you, uh, New Jersey governor, uh, former uh, GOP leader in your state and in the Bush administration, Christy Todd Whitman is my co-chair. Right. So we are we are completely nonpartisan and we've spoken out against gerrymandering, which is to us an example. Uh, whether it's done on either side of the agenda, the political spectrum of partisan politicians trying to uh, fundamentally change uh, how elections are run in this country. They want to grab more control for themselves and shift it away uh, from uh, the voters. Um, you know, we favor and we filed amicus briefs, um, including uh, luminaries from both sides of the aisle, like uh, former GOP governor in California, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right. We filed amicus briefs um, arguing that, um, you know, we need to find ways for trusted professional election officials and citizens like uh, nonpartisan um, uh, redistricting boards and commissions in the states uh, to make these um, to make these decisions. So gerrymandering is a is a, um, a very challenging approach uh, and and one that that the election denial movement is an example, I think, of. Um, uh, has many um, has many uh, tools in its toolkit, but if you look historically, uh, the gerrymandering, of course, uh, 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 got its name um, um, from um, the nineteenth century practices. So this is one that way predates. Uh, the um, 21st century election denial movement that we find ourselves in. It's a precursor and a dangerous one. Right. And, and are we at a point, uh, would it be fair to say, where uh, what we're seeing is, is gerrymandering on steroids? Um, well, I, I do think the gerrymandering battles continued in this cycle. 
we and others um we and others uh, pushed back on the gerrymandering um and we were able to achieve some some um uh some successes there's still way too much gerrymandering in our country mm-hmm. um i think that will have an impact it creates a um, disproportionate um uh, drag uh on the true view of the voters um if you just uh uh like the um uh other tools in the uh election denial toolkit um you know it does have an impact voters have to vote in much larger numbers but the good news judge is that we're actually seeing huge early vote totals that isn't always i think there's a note of alarm in the press that isn't always supported by the evidence and this is one where i think it's premature to call this election as the press is already doing for one yeah. side or another let's let the people vote for crying out loud and they're voting in huge numbers early voting numbers are large so you know let's reserve judgment on what the actual outcome is going to be sometimes if you uh catastrophize one way or the other it can actually suppress the vote absolutely so um just to get back to some of the things going on in state legislatures how are they going about seizing responsibility and and be to the extent that you can be be specific and and what are the voting burdens they they are establishing you know i i harken back on the old poll taxes but but we're beyond that i think we're more sophisticated than that at this point um well um uh you know the history of america is the history of the battle over the franchise right and uh it's not something that's unique uh to the united states to paraphrase um the dictator russian uh dictator and tyrant joseph stalin uh uh he's is he said uh the voting doesn't matter what matters is the vote counting who counts the votes uh, uh so um i think that uh i think that we see uh a variety of uh we see a variety of vehicles uh that are being used uh to um to drive this um uh election um uh, really uh i think it is uh misconduct you know the the we put it under the rubric of we talked about this the election deniers want to change the rules cuz the rules frustrated them in picking their own voters in 2020 Right. the minority of voters who wanted Trump over the majority who voted for Biden and they want to replace the refs judge so um uh we're seeing uh that uh, across the country um the um election deniers are um uh, in places where they serve in election positions already they're refusing to certify and the courts have told them you can't do that but refusing to certify elections we've seen that in Pennsylvania and New Mexico um there um but the good news is pushed back on the courts said no we just have had a big victory in Arizona where the uh, election denying vigilantes were surrounding drop boxes and harassing voters based on their bizarre theories and the courts said no you can't do that so voter harassment and then of course there's always the so there's we we can think of that as the insider threats and outsider threats and the most dangerous of those outsider threats is when you see political violence and of course we had the ter- we know that there is a this election denial movement has unleashed a terrible specter of disinformation of lies the big lie that trump act- actually won the 2020 election when he lost it feeds resentment and anger 
uh, and conspiracy theories, it's totally false, and uh, the threat of political violence, like the attack on um, the Speaker of the House's husband, Paul Pelosi, is an example of what we fear as part of and that attacker pointed to these crazy theories. That's the ultimate um, outsider threat. But the good news is um, he was apprehended by the police. He's being brought to justice. There's accountability. Uh, and so authorities and authorities are looking at all of this, Judge. Right. Um, the, in the state and federal authorities are looking at the uh, 2020 misconduct inside and outside by the former president and his allies and uh, some commentators, myself included, think as soon as the election is over, um, criminal charges will be brought starting in Georgia for this misconduct in 2020. So those are some of the tools. But the um, um, our justice system is pushing back. And that's good news. Now, you mentioned disinformation. What can state and local officials do to mitigate uh, this disinformation and its confusing impact on the voting public? And, and, and more importantly, I think, or as importantly, what can the media do? Uh, is there a role? Um, you know, the, the, um, the advent of disinformation, it's one of the most important um, things that we do at States United. We have, um, um, if you look on our website, uh, we do, uh, we work to support uh, and provide pro bono reinforcements for state officials. Uh, we've grown just since Christy and I co-founded it with uh, Joanna Lidgate, formerly the number two official in the Massachusetts AG's office over the past two years. We've grown to fix to 50 folks. Um, and uh, we deal with some of the things we've talked about, election protection litigation, um, accountability for those who attack our democracy, political violence, and the fourth main area, the driver of it all, disinformation. And what we've learned is that, um, you know, um, uh, uh, to uh, paraphrase the old saying, a lie can travel around the planet before the truth gets its shoes on. So we need to get running shoes and a, and a jet pack for the truth. How do you do that? Number one, and I would direct people to our, uh, to our website uh, for more details on this, um, uh, our States United Democracy, um, Number one, you have to amplify the truth and you've got to, the truth has got to outnumber the lies, the lies and the disinformation. So we really broadcast and blast out the truth and we share that with the public, the press. We do it on social media, traditional media, get the truth out. And there's a big um, uh, a set of uh, nonpartisan and bipartisan groups who do that to just outnumber. And then you have to do it in the right way, Judge. Um, don't, re don't repeat the lies. When we were starting to fight disinformation, I know I myself, if I saw a false tweet, I would retweet on top of the lie saying, this is not true. But I was amplifying. So we've learned instead of do a screenshot or summarize. Um, and then number three, you have to look, of course, for major disinformation. We count on the justice system. Look at the, um, um, uh, the, some of the litigation uh, that folks have brought in the wake of the 2020 election. It's not just those criminal cases we talked about, but there are important civil libel cases that have been brought for billions of dollars in damages against Fox News and uh, individuals uh, like Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, who spread lies about uh, voting machine manufacturers. They're being held to account. Uh, this new, um, one of the most potent forms of misinformation is the 2000 Mules um, a movie that was made by Dinesh D'Souza. He's being sued by one of the people he allegedly libeled in that 
uh, film. So those kinds of actions are also important. And then the press has to um, really call this stuff out. And that's part of the good news, too. The press is focusing on the election denial movement as a movement, wearing another one of my hats over at Brookings. I've been publishing a series of reports on election deniers. And if your listeners Google me and uh, Brookings and the words election denial, you'll also see uh, studies to um, analyze in a scholarly way what's going on here. Who are the election deniers? What do they want? Getting the truth out is the best antidote to disinformation. I think that everyone in the system has an obligation to act responsibly, to adhere to the truth, and um, that um, we count on our political leaders. uh, As you and I are taping this podcast, the President of the United States, not in a partisan way, uh, but as the leader of the country is preparing to make uh, remarks on what's said to be a landmark blockbuster speech on on our democracy. So we have to count on our political leaders. And I'm so pleased to, that's why I'm so pleased to be able in in a nonpartisan way, but as a bipartisan team with Governor Whitman, you know, I'm sure I do not agree with Governor Whitman. I know I do not agree with her on every policy issue, right? I'm a Democrat, she's a Republican. But we agree on and we talk about publicly as a as a pair with our wonderful colleague, Joanna, the principles and the best practices of democracy and of truth. And I hope all of our political leaders and all of our political parties uh, will do that. You know, there's we have higher duties than partisanship in this country. We we ultimately we're Americans. When I was ambassador I welcomed many a GOP official uh, to Prague, and we agreed on representing America abroad. It used to be a principle that politics stops at the water's edge. Many still believe that. I remember Congressman Dan Burton. Do you remember him, Judge? Sure. He was a leader. I was defending people from Congressman Burton's um attacks uh, in the Clinton impeachment and the various Clinton wars. And Congressman Burton, even though we were old adversaries, came to Prague and we worked together and seamlessly on policy issues. And at the end, he gave me a toast at my house. We had a big gathering and he, he said, Ambassador, after working with you for four days, I only have one question. Are you sure you're not a Republican? Because that was how much we agreed, the consensus. And I think we do see many of those, like Governor Whitman, my partner, on both sides of the aisle, who condemn some of the truly unfortunate activity. And I think we need to get back to that, where irrespective of party, you embrace democracy. That's probably as much as I should say about that, Judge. All right. We are running short of time, and this time has gotten away so fast. Uh, but I've been been advised that we're running short. But I do have one last question for you. And as you can well imagine, many of our listeners are students. Um, so I'm going to ask you, what guidance and advice would you give um, students with respect to getting involved in, in this stuff and, and what they can do? Um, you know, States United is, is a wonderful model. I've, I've gone to your website uh, I'm impressed with with everything I've seen, and and the election nerds and the Center for Election Reform uh, are going to post much of your stuff on our website as well uh, to share with, with with our population. Um, but what what would you say to the to the students who are listening? Uh, I would send the students um, to our statesunitedemocracy.org website. And I would say to the students um, that um, our future is in your hands. Never mind what uh, political party you belong to. Uh, We we, um, must embrace each other as Americans. 
and we have to tolerate and recognize our legitimate differences in policy, but all uh, work together to defend our democracy. That means standing up for the truth. So look at at stageunitedemocracy.org is a wonderful nonpartisan started by a Democrat and a Republican and a nonpartisan public official, the three of us. Um, A wonderful nonpartisan source for truth and facts. Do your investigation. And we have to stand up together for the rule of law. Uh, We can have legitimate differences. Um, but those commonalities are what has made America strong. They've defined American progress and they'll define our future. So let's, in our differences, let's unite to work together. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican or member of another party, an independent, a no, a member of no party at all, there's much more that unifies us as Americans, starting with the idea of truth, and of the rule of law, of free, fair, secure, and accurate elections. That's what undergirds our democracy, gives us legitimacy. Let's work together to defend those principles. And if we do, our best days are ahead of us as Americans, and you students will lead the way. We're counting on you. Ambassador Norman Eisen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Judge. Thanks for having me. It's been our pleasure. Today's podcast has been brought to you by the Eagleton Institute of Politics and the Center for Election Reform. Eagleton is a nonpartisan research unit of Rutgers University, New Brunswick. This moment in democracy was made possible in part by the generosity of Gerald and Kiko Harvey and Eagleton's many supporters. To support Eagleton's work, or sign up for its newsletter, click the links in the description. To learn more about the Institute, visit eagleton.rutgers.edu and follow Eagleton on social media. Thank you for listening.